Good morning, ZPC. Will you guys stand with us as we enter into worship together? Oh 
on his shoulder gently lay, and home rejoicing brought me. In death's dark veil, I fear no ill. With thee, dear Lord, beside me, thy rod and staff my comfort still. Thy cross is for to guide. continue to worship. We had a lot of fun putting this, this set together and we were kind of talking through what songs we wanted to sing with you guys this morning. We were inspired by it last week as we, uh, we were preached to from Revelation, talking about uh, glory and power and bowing down before God. And we came up with multiple songs and we were, couldn't decide which ones to do. And so we took them and we stuck them together. So we're going to have fun singing several of them together, uh, new and old. And so... Join with us in singing and giving God the glory that he has deserved. No matter what's happening in the world, he is faithful. He is worthy for our glory.
lift up our hands For the joy of the Lord is our strength We bow down and worship Him now How great, how awesome is He And together we sing Everyone sing Holy is the Lord God Almighty The earth is filled with His glory Holy is the Lord God Almighty The earth is filled with His glory privilege of being here with you all this morning and singing along with you instead of the little kiddos. Um, if you don't know who I am, my name is Becky Woods. I'm the director of children's ministries and typically I'm back in first through fourth grade on Sunday morning doing a little bit more action along with singing with some motions and dancing, but um, such a gift to be able to hear all of your voices and be able to welcome you this morning. If you are here for the first time, welcome to ZPC. If you would, we would love for you to stop by the welcome desk in the gathering space on your way out to find out more about ZPC, how you can get connected, and also pick up a gift. So make sure you do that on your way out. And if you stopped in the gathering space on your way in and went by the coffee center, you realized something was different this morning. Momco, formerly known as Mops, has their annual bake sale today. They are raising funds for their sister group in Romania, Mops, or I'm sorry, Momco, Romania. Um, and so all the proceeds go towards that. There are some donuts out there also. So if you want to buy a treat 
or you would like to just donate towards that cause, you can stop by the welcome or the coffee center. And then, I have one more piece that I get to tell you. I'm not up here to ask you to volunteer for Next Gen. I know you're a little surprised by that, but I had the wonderful privilege, along with Jerry and Brendan and Marissa, to take 15 of our high school kids on a leadership retreat this weekend. We did some worship and we went up around Chicago area. You can see them there taking some notes and listening. And we had selected some kiddos who have been very invested on Sunday mornings um, in Next Gen Ministry. They're here every week volunteering and they're here in the worship service. And it was such a gift. We have some of our seniors there who we're excited to build into. Um, as they're getting ready to leave and go to college. And so they ate, and they ate, and then we would have lunch, and five minutes later, they're like, when are we eating again? <laughs> so I have middle schoolers in my home, middle school boys, and I thought they ate a lot, but wow. So it was a wonderful weekend, um, but this is one of the ways that the money that you all give towards ZPC and your generosity allows us to do this. This was a gift for our kids, a way that we can build into them as we're making disciples to send out. And as they're getting ready for them to understand the impact of what they're doing and how they're serving and to help them grow in that way. So thank you for always being so generous. And on the screen, there's ways that you can continue to do that. Um, it just helps us connect people with each other and connect people with God. So let's continue in worship. Thank you, Becky. Uh, we haven't done this in a while, but the way that we're going to do this is in a reader and response fashion, so y'all get to participate. And this was kind of fitting, one, for the scripture today, but also for what Jerry was kind of challenging us as a body to a couple of weeks ago, which is abiding with Jesus over this next year. And I think that this phrase that we are all gonna to respond to together is a way of continuing to see and attend ourselves and abide with God. So I'm gonna read and then when it says response, we'll all respond together. When we are walking and talking or walking alone and cannot see the way ahead, whether we are standing still with a downcast face or our minds are sharp while we are moving about. Stay with us, O oh Lord. When we have awoken from a night full of rest and are met by a day of trials, stay with us, O oh Lord. When we hear of the tragedies of our community or the endless wars and rumors of war around the world, stay with us, O oh Lord. When we have found ourselves surrounded by darkness Though darkness is as light to you, stay with us, O oh Lord. When it becomes difficult to still ourselves in order to find peace, while a storm of busyness or trouble runs rampant around us, stay with us, O oh Lord. When our coming to this place is full of fear because of what another might think of us, Stay with us, O oh Lord, when our going from this place is full of doubt because we wonder what is to become of us. Stay with us, O oh Lord, whatever joys we find along the way and whatever fears lie beyond the next bend. Stay with us, O oh Lord. Lord, as we are quiet before you for these next few moments, May you stay with us.
please join me in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father and Lord of all, we come together this morning to worship you. Lord, there is no one like you, for you are great and your name is full of power. We are reminded in Psalm 84, you, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness and truth. We come to you this morning asking for forgiveness when we forget that you are God and we are not. We say that we trust you, and yet when we pray, we do so oftentimes thinking that we know what is best, and we certainly don't want to wait patiently for your answers. Please help us to truly trust in you and to know that you are God, that your timing is perfect, and that you always have our best interest in mind as your children. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the many amazing works of your creation, including our beautiful earth, moon, sun, and stars, and for the incredible total solar eclipse that took place this week. We also come today with gratitude for the blessing of our building project that is tangibly getting underway, for the construction team, contractors, and for our ZPC property team who have been working so diligently and persistently leading this effort. We pray for safety during construction and for patience and flexibility by all of us during construction. Thank you for the generosity of our church family who have supported the Catching the Wind building campaign to make this possible. We pray for pastors Scott Shelton and Stan Johnson and Jack Ellett as they are leading a pastor's conference in Romania for pastors and their wives. Please be with them during their time in Romania and we pray for their safe return. Father God, where there is strife and unrest around the world, like Israel and Ukraine and so many other countries, may people be drawn to you for peace and comfort. We pray for unity in our own country and that as a nation, we will turn to you. We lift up those in our church family who need specific healing and encouragement. We pray for your healing hand to be with Joan Gall and Jean Heck as they both recover. May they feel your presence at this time. Thank you for Pastor Jerry and for speaking through him as he preaches from Luke this morning. May your words bind to our minds and hearts and guide us through the coming week. Now, hear our collective prayer as we pray the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jane. Well, good morning, ZPC. It is good to be here with you. And I, uh, I certainly echo that prayer. I thought the solar eclipse, I got to be honest with you, I thought it was going to be a lot of hullabaloo about not much. And uh, I was like, I would hardly travel down the block to see this thing. And then I saw it and it was, it was incredible. It really was. I was, uh, I was aghast at just how amazing it was. So uh, just really how remarkable uh, of a scene that was and a time that that was. And so we certainly uh, give God praise for his creation and the mysteries therein. Uh, before we dive into Luke today, I do have a few things I want to say. One of those, uh, as Jane again did a wonderful job of talking about in the prayer, is our construction that's coming up. And I mentioned this quickly last week. I do have a laser pointer. It's probably not going to be helpful, but I'm going to use it anyways. Uh, I'm going to use it probably on this side. There we go. So uh, here's what we're going to do. I just want to try to help you to see what it's going to be like, not next Sunday, but the Sunday after. So here we are. Okay. Here I am right here. And uh, so this is our main entrance, and this is going to have fencing. I think the fencing is going to be going all around here. So we're going to have lots of fencing, and uh, there will be no access through this main entrance. Uh, sorry if you can't. It's just not going to work. So, um, 
So anyway, so we're going to be, uh, so there will be no access to this at all during all of construction, and that's going to be, uh, that's going to be a little bit tough. So we're going to have two uh, real main entrances uh, during this time. The, uh, one will be here on the east entrance, okay? So that's the, what sometimes is called the Noah's Ark entrance. This is the entrance facing Carmel. Uh, and so this is where many of you will come. Now, let me just say this. The parking that's over on this side is somewhat limited, so one of the encouragements we're going to have is that if you are not uh, uh, physically limited, that you don't park on that east side. Uh, but if you are, uh, if you have some mobility issues, if you're pregnant, uh, whatever it may be, um, um, then we would encourage you to park on this east side, uh, and you can certainly walk through there. Uh, and then um, uh, also the south entrance will be open, and so we can also use this. Now, again, I know this is kind of confusing, but we'll get it eventually, probably right about the time we're done with construction. The, um, we're going to ask if you don't have children uh, to kind of come through the gym, uh, to come through the gym. So to come this way or to come up this way and go through the gym, because this is going to be a little bit congested uh, where our uh, children are going to be primarily. So we would ask you to not go that direction, to come through the gym. This is where we'll have some of our typical gathering space things, coffee, donuts, and whatnot. And then we will go through here. Now, eventually, this will also be shut down. That's when it really gets fun. But that's not going to happen yet. So let's not worry about that. Let's just go through the south and through the east entrance. Again, next Sunday, you're good to go through the main entrance. After that, things will change. Um, there are other details that will come during the week. Uh, you will be using this east entrance Sunday, or excuse me, Monday through Friday. If you need to come here, you will come through here. Um, and there will be other security measures that we have up here for Noah's Ark during the week. But we just kind of wanted to give you a general sense uh, we'll have a lot of signage. We're going to try to communicate and over-communicate and over-communicate as much as we possibly can. Uh, but I, I think that we'll get that, but it will definitely take a while. Uh, and so, yeah, patience and flexibility is certainly going to be the name of the game over the next, uh, let's just call it a year. Uh, and if it's less than that, we can all be um, excited about that. So, uh, so there's that information. Again, we'll keep coming back to you. There'll be stuff on the website. If you have any questions, we're also going to have a lot of uh, signage and a lot of people that will be lined up in different places just to kind of let you know where to go. So not this Sunday, not uh, obviously, not next Sunday, but then after that, this will be uh, the way that we are going. Okay, so uh, please, we are thankful. We saw the trailer that was out there. Uh, so um, yep, this afternoon, Ashley's going to lead us on some tours of that trailer. If you, I'm just kidding. And so uh, I, I don't, we haven't been in there yet. We'll see what it's like. It'll be fun. Um, so any questions, please talk to me, anyone on the property team, an elder, uh, and we will be happy to help. Uh, one of the other things then, you know, why are we doing this? I think it's always good for us to keep remembering the why. And a big part of this, of course, is thinking about who's next, who's not yet here, um, and then also about this next generation. And uh, Becky Woods talked about uh, this weekend a lot. Uh, this is one more picture. I love this picture. You know, this is us praying. And I looked at myself and I saw this picture and I don't know what I'm thinking, but I know our time when we were doing this prayer, it was around midnight. Uh, and usually by this time, I've been sleeping for three hours. So I could not uh, wait. I'm sure that I was praying uh, for us to finish up, but I was also, uh, I want you to know that research shows quite significantly uh, that young people whose faith kind of remains intact as they get older are those who uh, realize that they have a meaning and purpose in being a part of the church. And that's one of the things that we do. I give uh, um, a lot of uh, props to, uh, to Brendan Saget uh, and to the others that went with us, but just this sense of these are these high schoolers who are investing, uh, you can take that down, I'm tired of seeing myself, who are investing, thank you, on Sunday mornings um, in, in our younger kids. And it gives them this real sense that they have uh, something to contribute, which they do. Uh, and so uh, I just want to say again how thankful I am to this congregation for the ways in which we are investing in the next generation. It will not just happen. Uh, it takes real intentionality. So I'm very thankful to that. Uh, I'm also, of course, thankful for our mission and, you know, um, Pastor Scott, Pastor Stan, and Jack Ellett. Already this morning, they have all preached uh, in, 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 little, in churches around Romania uh, and so I'm, I'm excited as well to be a part of a congregation who knows that God loves the whole world. Amen? 
All right. I think that's enough, and I have no time to preach, so we'll just say amen. I'm just kidding. There's always time to preach. We've got, um, this is our penultimate Sunday in the Gospel of Luke. We've got this Sunday and then next Sunday, and then we will be done. Uh, and so uh, today we are doing uh, the great uh, passage of Luke 24, verses 13 through 35, about uh, the men, the two pilgrims, I should say, the two disciples on their way to Emmaus. And so with that, let us hear these words from Luke. Luke says this, now on that same day, that same day you should know is Easter Sunday. Two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with him. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all of this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body, there they came back, there they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with, this, with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on, but they urged him strongly saying, stay with us because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Sisters and brothers in Christ, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God, we do pray that you would reveal yourself to us this morning. Help us to see you. And I pray that the words of my mouth, the meditation of all of our hearts will be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen and amen. So this really is one of the more beloved stories in the gospel of Luke and maybe even in all of scripture. This is the third time since I've been here that I have preached on this passage, but I also say it uh, or remind us of it several times during the year when we uh, break bread together. And I say, Jesus took bread, he blessed it, he broke it and gave it to them. And then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. It's a great story. In many ways, it's great because we are invited into this journey that these two disciples are taking. Uh, one of the ways it seems to me that, we're that we are invited into this story is by a couple kind of key elements of ambiguity. One of those is uh, we know that one of the pilgrims is named Cleopas, but we are never told the name of the other 
traveler. And so there are some who would suggest it must be Cleopas' wife, and, and that's who this is. And that's a great thought. It makes us feel good and cozy. It's, it would be a hallmark moment. But we really don't have any evidence for that. The truth is we don't really know for sure who it is, but what I love about that is what this does then is that it invites us to actually picture ourselves there next to Cleopas in this journey so that we could really say if we wanted to as we you know talk about putting ourselves into the stories of scripture and so we can think to ourselves you know there it's Cleopas and Greg who are walking on this road to Emmaus right it's Cleopas and it's Kara who are walking down this road to Emmaus it's Cleopas and Doug who are walking down on this road to Emmaus. I want us to picture, what what would we be thinking? What would we be feeling if we were one of these pilgrims? Of course, the other thing that's somewhat strange about this is that we don't really know what this town of Emmaus is that they're talking about. We do have understandings of there being an Emmaus or two in that area, but, but none that were seven miles away from Jerusalem. This is not to suggest that Luke's odometer is kind of messed up. It is to suggest that we simply don't know that much, if anything, about this Emmaus, which then again invites us to say, what would this Emmaus be to us? Barbara Brown Taylor says, you know, this Emmaus, maybe it's this place of disillusionment when all of our hopes have been dashed. Frederick Beekner says, maybe this is the place to which we escape whenever it is that we are fearful, whenever it is that we are lost or bored or afraid, we go to this Emmaus. What we know is that it's not Jerusalem. These disciples could not wait to get away from Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the place where Jesus had been that week ahead of time teaching doing remarkable things. That place, though, of course, where they had broken bread together, that place where then the trial and where he had died, but the place as well where there was an empty tomb where they had clearly heard rumors that Jesus might be alive, and yet even those rumors could not keep them there. They had to get away. And so they begin to journey to Emmaus when this stranger shows up next to them. We know two things for sure. One, we know that the stranger was Jesus. All the way, very early in this part of the story, just the third verse in, Luke tells us this is, this is Jesus. Luke wants us as the reader, us as the audience, the listener to know beyond the shadow of a doubt that it is Jesus who is walking with these pilgrims. And secondly, what he wants us to know is that these disciples had no idea who the stranger was was. They did not recognize Jesus. What I want us to see is that this is this amazing scene where basically what Luke is doing when he, when he describes this is he's giving us these, these kind of sacred, these holy glasses, and he's having us put them on, right? Without them, we don't see who it is. We just see this stranger, right? We don't understand. We see the pilgrims well, but when we see through this lens, all of a sudden when we put them on, we're like... <laughs> It's Jesus. And Luke is telling us, there they are. They're just walking. And even though you don't see, they don't see. It's almost comedic. It is Jesus who is literally next to him. And Luke is just sitting there saying, come, 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 take a look, take a look. And, and we look through and we say, Jesus, not Jesus. Jesus, not Jesus. And he's trying to get us to see this kind of remarkable thing as we look at this passage. But you know what else, of course, Luke is trying to do is Luke is not just trying to give us these glasses so that we can see the Jesus in the scripture who's right there and those disciples have no idea who he is. He is also trying to help us to see where Jesus is in our midst. And yet, if we don't have the glasses, the lens to see it, we will completely miss him again and again and again. I came across this remarkable 
poem by Elizabeth Barrett Browning a little while ago. She's kind of talking about Moses and the burning bush, but I think it is incredibly appropriate for what we are talking about. Here's, here's the poem. It says this, earth is crammed with heaven and every common bush a fire with God, but only he who sees it, who has these glasses, takes off his shoes. The rest sit around it and pluck blackberries. I'm going to I'm going to read it one more time. Let's say, I'm sorry, Rachel. Let's go through it one more time. Earth is crammed with heaven. In other words, there is heaven everywhere here. And every common bush a fire with God, but only he who sees takes off his shoes. In other words, only he who sees recognizes the holy place that they are. The rest sit around it and pluck blackberries. So what is it? What is it that keeps these pilgrims from being able to see the risen Jesus? What is it that helps them or keeps them from seeing that this is more than just blackberries? And what is it that helps them eventually to recognize Jesus? That's the line, it seems to me. This is the thing that we wrestle with. One of the things that clearly keeps them from seeing the risen Savior here is their incredible grief and sadness. This is one of the more poignant lines, it seems to me, in Luke. I love just how clear it is where Luke just says this. They stood still looking sad. They stood still looking sad. What a great image for deep sadness and grief. We talk about stillness here and being still before the Lord, but this kind of silent sadness and stillness is a different kind of stillness. It's actually, in many ways, almost the exact opposite. You know, one of the things that we say is that we want to slow down so that we can notice more things. And I don't know about you, but when I am deeply, deeply sad or disappointed, I notice, A, that I just naturally begin to walk more slowly. And so you would think that I would notice more things, but the truth is this, when you are in deep sadness like this, if I were to walk 50 yards and you were to say to me, what did you notice? I could not tell you anything that I had noticed. Because when you are walking that slowly because of sadness and grief, all you can think about, all that you can see is darkness and disappointment and hopelessness. And for these disciples then, it is difficult for them to be able to see Jesus in the midst of that deep, dark sadness. Of course, a part of the problem as well is that we in the church are not very good at helping one another be okay with feeling this sadness and this grief and this disappointment it's a part of our culture as well of course here in America but but we in the church oftentimes accentuate it and and so we we want to, we we want to say no 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 it's all good Jesus is good ah huh? say Jesus is good just think about Jesus and you'll start smiling and you'll forget everything and i hear it I hear our uncomfortableness with being sad or being disappointed, right? I've, I've brought this up before that, you know, what oftentimes when people meet with me and they, they tell me this, this thing that's happening in their life and, you know, but, but, but towards the end, after kind of talking to me, maybe even through tears, they say, but I know it gets much worse for some other people. It's a lot worse for people over there. It's a lot pe worse for people over there. It's not that bad. And it is this inability to just simply stay in their sadness and to just admit the pain. That's not the only thing, though. I also, you know, from time to time, we, I, I, I hear people talk about when they come in, they say, I, I know I shouldn't be feeling like this. I, I know I shouldn't still be mad at him or I shouldn't still be upset with her. I, I know I shouldn't be feeling this. I should be able to move on. And there's this fascinating judgment of what they are feeling. Rather than just allowing themselves to feel what they are feeling, there is this constant kind of, you know, assessment of, oh, should I be feeling this? Should I not? Rather than just being fully present and just saying, this is you know what, this is just how it is. 
We want to just move on. And even with the pastor, we say, oh, yeah, yeah, I know Jesus says it's it's all going to be fine. And we want to just move on. I I really appreciate uh, uh, Ruth Haley Barton. uh, And when she's kind of talking through some of these things, uh, she says uh, says this. She says, we should pay attention to our life as, as it is being given to us right now. Does that make sense? As it is being given to us right now. In other words, what we tend to do is we tend, especially when we are in difficult or challenging places like these uh, uh, pilgrims were, uh, we, we, we tend to not be very present. We tend to think, oh, in the, in, in the days ahead, it will be better. Or, oh, things were so much better in the past. And we tend not to be present. But these disciples, I love this, what they said. They said, we had hope. And it is an invitation when you say, when they say we had hoped, it is an invitation for us to bring all of those. Who of us does not have something to say we had hoped? We had hoped that this would happen differently in our lives. We had hoped that this job would have worked out. We had hoped that this relationship was going to work out. We had hoped that this dream would be there. If I sat around and said, I'd love for all of us to write down what we had hoped for, we would be able to fill a scroll after scroll after scroll. But you see, the invitation here of this story is to be able to say, look, right there, if we have the eyes to see, even in the midst of this, Jesus is with them right there. Everything isn't made better immediately, but Jesus is right there walking alongside of them. So one of the things that keeps us from being able to see Jesus, the risen Savior, especially in sadness, is when we just try to think about getting beyond it without actually pondering this reality of that Jesus is there right now. What, what some people have called this is it's a crisis of not necessarily a faith, but a crisis of imagination. You see that the, 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 the disciples had one real clear view of, of, of who Jesus was going to be. We know this, right? Who is Jesus going to be? Jesus is going to be someone who is triumphant, someone who overcomes the Romans, someone who has this great worldly power, someone who does not suffer, who is not in pain. We have this real clear view. This is who Jesus is. This is what God looks like. And because their view was so clear and they had this picture perfect box, Jesus was literally standing right next to them and because it didn't fit there they could not see him and so many of us it seems to me we we have this picture perfect view of God and if you question it they don't ever see Jesus and quite honestly they get angry when anyone says you know what I wonder if God looks different than that a lot of times it's the view we may have had when we were kids of who God is I I love this on this on the drive um uh, let's see here, up to the Chicago area, uh, I was uh, talking to one of our high schoolers, uh, and he said, and I don't think he just said this because I was a pastor, I, I wondered for a moment, but he said to me, as we were driving, I was reading uh, the book of Genesis. And he said, you know what? He, and, and, and then he brought up like three different questions that were really good questions. Like, where did Cain's wife come from? Go talk to Brendan, I said. <laughs> Just these really great questions, right? About, 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 about scripture. And I loved it, you see, because this is the thing. He's like, he's like, I don't remember this in like the Jesus storybook Bible. I don't remember this story. I don't remember the story about Noah being drunk and what happens with his kids. And, and, and that's just weird. And what happened there? And I love that because it's the sense of, of this is what happens, right? We need to have the humility and, and the childlike way in which to read and to think, oh yeah, that breaks in many ways what I thought about God. As we begin, as we mature in the faith, it should be constantly kind of challenged as we read. This is why we've gone through Luke. We want there to be times where we say, wow, that's not exactly what I thought when it comes to God. And so there's this, there's this sense, right, of, of how Scripture helps to, helps to kind of soak us in this biblical imagination, and that's exactly what Jesus does, right? Remember what Jesus does. He begins to expound scripture 
to them. He begins to help them to see scripture in a different way. Richard Tannehill says that before their eyes were ever opened to the fact that this was Jesus, he says, Jesus opened their eyes to scripture. And so they began to see Jesus in a new way. This is all a part of the process of them being able to see the resurrected Savior in their midst. Because here's what, here's what happens, even just this story. When you become, when you, your imagination becomes soaked in the story to Emmaus, here's what happens. When you are in a place of sadness or deep grief, you begin to remember consciously or subconsciously that it is not because God is not with you because you remember the story on the road to Emmaus. You remember that when you had this, or or maybe even in the midst of having a a strange conversation with a stranger, something that doesn't quite make sense, and you're like, man, this this person is strange, or how does he not know this? How does she not hear about this? This is strange, and you remember, wait a second. Jesus was also a stranger having a strange conversation. You remember that every time that you gather around a table, whenever you are there at a table, you remember that Jesus is there in the midst of it. And so you begin to say, if you've been kind of soaked in the story, I wonder where, I wonder where Jesus is here. I may have told the story several years ago. I don't remember. But when I was uh, in college, I spent one summer, a month of a summer in Chicago working uh, uh, with the ministry there in Chicago. And so one, uh, one night we went down uh, to an area, uh, uh, many of you I know have, are familiar with Chicago, called Lower Wacker. Uh, and there were a lot of homeless at that time down there. There may still be, I don't know. But, but there were a lot of homeless down there. So we would, we, would make, uh, we would make sandwiches and make a meal. And then we would head down uh, uh, in this van and we'd go down and we'd, we'd, hand, we'd distribute the food to the homeless who were kind of camped out there and then we would have conversations and we would listen and we would talk to them and then we would, you know, if it seemed like it was open, if it seemed like it was open, I would pray with them. Some people just prayed and I, I would oftentimes say, is it okay if I pray? And so we did that and, and, and so we were in this group, right? There's a, there a few of us and we were talking to this homeless person and there was a homeless uh, gentleman who was a little wi- uh, ways away and I saw that he was alone and, and so I, you know, I didn't really want to go over there because I kind of liked uh, where I was. I didn't have to say much. It was oftentimes these were kind of uncomfortable conversations. And so I just kind of want to say here, but I just kept kind of feeling like, oh, Jerry, you should go there. And, 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 and so finally I said, all right, I'm going to go over there. So I went over there and I brought me you know, a little lunch and a little bag and I offered it to him. And I found out that his name was Sam. And uh, so we continued to talk, Sam and I did, and uh, I began to hear a little bit more of his story. And, and then I also heard that, that he had just gotten a job at Enterprise Rental Car. And, and in fact, he was going to start, I think it was the very next day, maybe it was the day after. And, and, uh, and so we continued this conversation. And, and, and so I, I, I said to him, all right, Sam, well, you know what, is, can I pray with you? And he's like, yeah, please. And, he, and I said, what, can I, what would you like for me to pray for? He said, will you pray that I wake up tomorrow morning uh, on time? Because I got to get there early. I think he had to get there like at four or five in the morning. I got to get there early and I want to make sure that I make it. And I said, okay, absolutely. I'll pray with you. So I prayed with them. We got into the bus and we started to leave. And as we started to leave, I said, could I asked the bus driver, can you just stop? Or the van driver, can you just stop, please? So he stopped and I got out and, and I went over to him and I took off my watch. Now, please hear me. This is not a fancy watch. This was well before there were Apple watches. This watch was probably a $10 Casio watch. I have no idea what it was, but it wasn't great. But here's what it did have on it. It had an alarm. So I took it off and I began to hand it to him. And then there was this most remarkable thing. I was immediately overcome. And this doesn't happen to me uh, with emotion. And I began to weep. It was really embarrassing. And I began to weep. And all I could keep saying was, Jesus loves you. Sam, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. And and I went back and I handed it to him and I went back and I got in the van and I just kept weeping and I couldn't tell why, but here's what I knew. I had never felt the love of Jesus like I felt it in that moment. There we were, we had broken bread together. There we were in this stranger. And whether or not I was, uh, 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 Jesus was working through me or whether or not it was Sam and Jesus was working through him, I think actually it was both. But in this, in this stranger, there was this remarkable experience where I felt the risen Savior like I had never felt it before. I can't explain it. It hasn't happened to me like that as far as I can recall for the last 30 years. 
I mean, it was remarkable. And only now, right, as I look through this, I think, man, that's why my heart was burning as I went over there. And this is this remarkable experience. We never know with whom we are talking that might help us to begin to see the risen Savior. It only occurs as we begin to see it through the lens of Scripture. Jason said, as we went through this liturgy, he talked about how last week we mentioned, or two weeks ago, we mentioned abiding with Jesus. I think this is really one of the more important things to see about the road to Emmaus. When it comes to the road to Emmaus, what we tend to talk about, of course, is that they recognize Jesus just at the table. But what I want you to hear is that actually they recognize Jesus uh, because of the fact that he was abiding with them. They were abiding with him throughout the whole day. This is not just something that happened at the table. Sometimes you hear about these overnight successes, right? I, I, was, uh, I was listening to a podcast. Um, uh, there's this water called Liquid Death. You can look it up. It sounds weird. Uh, but I was listening to uh, this podcast, and it's funny because we talk about, you know, overnight successes all the time. But then when you hear about the story, right, it's actually like 15 or 20 years of time it took, right, for them to kind of work it and have things fail and have things succeed and have nobody care, all of this. But, of course, what do we tend to focus on? We tend to focus on, man, this thing's only been up for like three or four years and look how great it's doing, right? There are very few things like overnight successes. We tend to focus on what happened here at this table where all of a sudden they recognize Jesus, but here's the truth. They were abiding throughout the whole day. And then what do they say to Jesus right as they get to the town, right before he leaves? What do they say? Stay with us. There is a sense of of abiding that they have been doing all day long, staying with Jesus. And only as they stayed with Jesus, only as they began to see kind of the scripture, only as they continued to walk and to listen and to pay attention, only then were they put in a position to be able to see the risen Savior. And that's what happens when they get to the table. Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, and he gave it to them. And then their eyes were opened. Why is that the final straw? Likely, it is because of the fact, as Luke kind of points out here, it's the same verbiage that he gave earlier It's because it stokes their memory. They remember they were either there or they heard about it. They remember that Jesus had done that at that Maundy Thursday, if you will, and it reminded them. And that was when they recognized him. Fred Craddock says it like this. He says, remembering is often the activating of the power of recognition. For this reason alone, it is most important that the teacher and the preacher share with the listeners the story of Jesus and of the church. Such recitals may not strike fire at the time or be heard as matters of burning relevance. However, the times will come when the congregation will remember and it will make all the difference. But one cannot remember what one has not heard. One of the things this reminded me of is this. I know that we have parents, because I talk to them, who have children who it seems like are no longer on any kind of road toward Jesus or the road toward Emmaus as they've gotten older. And there is this fear and this concern, and I get it. But one of the things that this story, it seems to me, reminds us of is the fact that you never know when those things have been laid down when they were children and and middle schoolers and high schoolers, those stories that have been there, their stories are not just kind of gone. It's not like they've just disappeared. And you never know when that child who's no longer on the path or a grandchild or a parent or, or a sibling or a friend, whatever it may be that we think, oh my goodness, it's like they've never heard this story. Those stories are still there. And you never know in this journey, on this road, what it might be, who it might be who reminds them of this. Of course, the other thing that it reminds me of is the importance 
of the fact that the teaching that we do, especially to our kids, I really appreciated uh, the way that Fred Craddock says this. You can tell that he's uh, taught and preached a lot when he says that these recitals uh, may not strike fire or be heard as matters of burning relevance, right? We've said this before, that when you teach like a middle schooler, you know, the look on their face was, you just try to make this interesting, right? I don't care how hard you try to make this funny. I am not laughing. It's like they are pinching themselves to make sure that they never laugh. And quite frankly, it's kind of true with adults as well. But, you know, this is the sense, right, that, 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 that it may not feel like it matters at all. What does it matter at all? In fact, again, one of, the, one of the high schoolers that we were talking about as we were kind of telling them how important they are to what they're doing this weekend said, you know what, I, I don't know. I, I, only, I really just work with a couple of kids. And, and they said, I never really thought about the fact that this actually matters that much, that it's really going to be remembered. And I want you to know, and I realize this may seem like a shameless plug, but if we, you know, if you sat there, and looked at the tapestry of faith, right? And you think about who is it when you were younger, who is it that taught you these stories? Who is it who taught you about Jesus? Who is it who showed you who Jesus was? If you remembered that, I have a sneaking suspicion that we would be turning volunteers away from teaching our children. Because you would realize just what kind of impact actually that can have. It is remarkable how these things that have happened in the past, how these memories that we have, that there will be something at some point that sparks that, and all of a sudden, they see Jesus for the first time, or the second time, or the first time in a long time. But I was also reminded of this importance of memory and seeing the risen Savior at the most important times, several weeks ago. Several weeks ago now, I w- went in to see um, Jan West, who's 86, and um, she was in the hospital and would die just a, w- a week or two later. And, you know, I, again, I, I think I've probably shared this. I oftentimes will do Psalm 23 when I'm there, and we'll read Psalm 23. There's a couple different reasons. One of the reasons why is because it has that great line, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. I almost always, I, I read it, when, especially if it's an older person, I read it from the King James Version because this is the one, you know, I mean, the thou, just it should be thou, it should be art. And when I went in there, you know, Jan was kind of in and out of consciousness, you know. She would, she would kind of mumble a couple things, but it was kind of in and out. And, but I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read through this 23rd Psalm with you, Jan. And I did so, and as I was reading it, you know, I could see her, and she is, she's mumbling those words. She's... She's reciting those words that might, you know, that she had heard again and again and again. It was deep in her memory. This is what Craddock says. The time will come when the congregation or the congregation member will remember it and it will make all the difference. That in those moments when we are there in the shadow of death, the reminder that the risen Savior is with us. It is a holy moment when you can gather around a table or a hospital bed and share bread and scripture together. There is a holiness when we can turn an ordinary table or room into a thin place where we are able to see how earth is crammed with heaven. The question is never whether or not Jesus is there. The question is always whether we see him or whether we are simply picking blackberries. But the more that we see Jesus, the more that each of us see Jesus, I love this, 
the disciples on that day, they run back to Jerusalem, and all of a sudden, they are talking to others who have also seen him. This is a community who understands that the risen Savior is right there in their midst. Were not our hearts burning within us? May it be so. Amen? Amen. Amen. God, we pray that as we gather this morning in order to break bread, that just as you revealed it to those disciples long ago, that you would reveal it to us even now. That whatever it is that we are going through, Lord, whether it is deep grief or joy, whether it all seems strange to us, whether we have forgotten, it seems, the stories that we were told of Jesus long ago, that at this time and at this moment, we would recognize you. Pray all of this in the name of the risen Savior. Amen and amen. Sisters and brothers in Christ, we are reminded that the invitation to this table is one that is given to those who believe that even those who doubt or whose trust may be wavering, even those who are on this journey and the memory seems something so distant and fuzzy, that you are invited to this table in order to be assured of God's grace and love and Jesus Christ. And in so doing, might we, just like those who are on their way to Emmaus, see and recognize the risen Savior. Let us pray. God, we pray for your spirit to come upon this bread and this cup. Open our eyes to you. It's in your name we pray. Amen and amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, he took bread. And after blessing it, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take and eat. This is my body, which has been broken for you. And whenever you eat of it, you do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant, sealed in my blood, and shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink of it, you do this in remembrance of me. For every time that you eat of this bread, every time that you drink of this cup, you are proclaiming the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes again. Sisters and brothers, we'll be partaking today by you coming down. I invite you to come down, take a piece of bread and a cup, and then you can return uh, to your chair and you can uh, eat and drink there. Uh, if you need something gluten-free, there are gluten-free wafers uh, in each uh, of the bread trays, so I invite you to do that. If you come down this side, uh, please just come around and go back in that direction. If you're in the middle, you can come down here and then go back there. And if you're over here, please come down and then return along that side there. I invite our servers now, if you would please come forward so that we can eat and drink. The table is served. Please come eat and drink.
Let's pray. God, we do pray for your spirit again. As we take of your body and blood, we pray, Lord, that we would be transformed. Help us to see you. It's in your name we pray. Amen and amen. I invite you to stand. Rachel, can you do me a favor real quick? I just want us to see that uh, poem once again by Elizabeth Barrett Browning. I I want this to kind of uh, wash over you. Earth is crammed with heaven and every common bush afire with God. But only he who sees takes off his shoes. The rest sit around it and pluck blackberries. Where are you today? Are you seeing Jesus or are we plucking blackberries? My encouragement for you this week is just to wrestle with that. Where are you seeing Jesus? If you're in a place of sadness, maybe saying, I know that Jesus is here. Where is he? Maybe it's just simply by beginning to say, well, is my understanding of God, is it, is it limited? And, and what does it look like for me to see God through these biblically soaked lens? Maybe you just simply all week, you just read this story again and again. And maybe you happen onto a stranger this week and you say, Jesus, where were you there? I invite you to begin to say, through what glasses are you seeing the world around you? And with that, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you this day and until Christ Jesus returns. Hallelujah. Amen? Amen. Amen.